All right, so um, so let me start a little review of something that we've done back when we were covering um, back when we were covering the uh, the conservation of energy and momentum. Uh, in fact, we brought this up when we were doing energy, and this is something that we call mixed strategy problem. Um, I'm trying to have this object do what's called the loop the loop maneuver. Uh, have it go through this circular motion quickly enough so that it can actually complete the motion without losing contact with the surface. And you've seen that, that if I release it from this position here, then it doesn't actually uh, have enough energy, by which I mean that as I let it go at the bottom here, it's not moving fast enough in order to be able to, as it goes up, retain enough of the speed to continue moving this circular motion. You will say come off the track and do this instead. So what we worked out um, back when we were covering this is basically we have to have this condition met. Let me uh, write this out with an annotation tool here. So we have to imagine the snapshot when the ball is at this position here. And we have to think of the ball here moving at enough speed at the top so that certain conditions are met. So we are trying to make it so that um, the, this surface of contact remains in contact. And what that means practically is that when you imagine drawing the free body diagram here, let me just draw it on the side, then uh, the kind of the forces on this ball it's going to be gravity and the normal force actually pushing in the same direction because normal force is going to be perpendicular to the surface contact away from the surface contact. So when you look at this free body diagram, uh, as you try to look at where this object barely remains in contact, you are looking at the situation where normal force is going to zero, just barely approaching zero. So, um, so in that minimal situation where normal force has gone to zero, then you know your net force in the downward, the, the center facing direction is mg, and that should be equal to mass times the centripetal acceleration. So uh, when you, well, let me just solve for that quickly. So when you have mg is equal to mass times centripetal acceleration, that's the speed at the top, squared divided by the radius of the circle. Then um, solving for speed at the top, cancel out mass. The speed at the top should be uh, at a minimum of um, r times g square rooted. So when you start the um, uh, start your the object here, it has to start out with enough gravitational potential energy that when it comes to this position, that it it needs to um, it, it it needs to have enough kinetic energy to have this much uh, speed. So uh, so that's why starting from here isn't enough. I'm setting it up basically so that when it comes to this position, it'll have zero speed and that's not fast enough. It has to be faster than that. So, um, so when we went through the derivation, um, so, you know, go through kind of um, your, so somewhere up here, um, your snapshot one, and compare that with uh, your snapshot two here, and you use conservation of energy, total energy at snapshot one is equal to total energy at snapshot two. And uh, so you have gravitational potential energy um, plus the kinetic energy that's equal to the gravitational potential energy in snapshot two plus kinetic energy. And this is not going to be zero as uh, one might have assumed when you're starting from here. So you need to say, okay, mgh, some height it's starting from plus, uh, oh, the, but its initial kinetic energy will be zero because you will release it from rest that has to be equal to, um, the height here will be double the radius. And I'm gonna just uh, have it so that I can ignore the radius of the circle itself. Um, let's just say that we can ignore that. <laughs> so it'll be just uh, mg, um, mg2r uh, plus the kinetic energy here that comes from this. 
So one half times mass times v squared, this thing squared, which will be r times g. So when you work it out, you know, g's can, uh, sorry, m's cancel out, and oh, g's cancel out as well, and you get for this height h, 2r plus one half r. So the height that it starts from should be um, 2.5 r. So the kind of the height that it would be plus half the radius. That's what you need. And I think uh, uh, back when we were doing this uh, simulation last time, uh, we had, uh, let me just erase some of this to make room. Uh, I think I, I don't, I'm not going to need this anymore. Because um, all this analysis really went to driving what speed do you need. Uh, so what we did the last time we did this simulation is we kind of set this up ruler so that uh, I have a sense of what the radius is. Okay, it uh, radius is uh, 3, 4 point, uh, 4.1, 4.2 meters. Sorry, that's a 2 times R, so radius is 2.1 meters. So half the radius would be about 1 meter. So I need to, uh, starting from here, which is actually a little bit above where it would be. Starting from here, I need to be about one point some meter above. So I need it to be somewhere here in order for it to have enough um, potential energy, to have enough kinetic energy here to, to go through the thing. So let's just uh, test it out and uh, to double check that nothing's changed in the simulation and then do the new thing that we are gonna look at. So when you run this, now this is quite um, unrealistic scenario. You see this uh, circle thing just uh, sliding because it's a frictionless setup. And that is necessary for it to do what it's gonna do, you know, make this loop-the-loop -loop maneuver without, uh, without coming off the track. Good, <laughs> that's what we wanted. And uh, what I pointed out last time without explaining is that once you make this realistic, you know, imagine this as a steel ball. So give it a little bit of a uh, friction coefficient or, you know, a little more. Think of it as a rubber ball, not a steel ball. And think of, of this as a rubber track, not a, uh, it already has friction coefficient. So once you start introducing friction, then it does do more realistic thing, which is that when I run the simulation, it'll roll. It'll roll without slipping, as you know, it should. <laughs> Most of balls roll without slipping. And as it does that, what you will find is that the height that we started out at it's not enough for it to um, for it to actually complete the loop the loop maneuver, and it's not going to be a matter of how um, how um, how large the radius of this is. I showed in the the other simulation that even if I made this ball really small, or actually let me do it again. I think I can do it again. Um, even if you make this ball super small, oh okay. Um, let me demonstrate it and then I will try to undo it because it keeps uh, getting rid of that wedge thing or actually let me do it this way. Um, I have this ball. I can create a second ball that is smaller. That way I can have wedge thing with both of them and not lose the wedge. Um, so uh, the lighter ball, let me make it a gray. So even if the ball were small, you know, smaller, it'll still do the same thing. So let me just do the test without the friction to make sure, okay, with a small ball, it still does the loop-the-loop -loop thing. And um, once I introduce a friction, uh oh, it, it is, was it not high enough? Uh, maybe just a little bit. Because before I think the radius of the thing was might have been pushing up the center of mass high enough that um, my a little bit of imprecision didn't matter, but now it might be mattering. Yeah, in fact, what I need to do is I need to push this up so that it's actually, okay. I think that's where it should be. <laughs> so <laughs> from there, <laughs> as you look at it, uh, so it's, I'm just gonna move it up a little. It's a matter of where the center of mass is uh, before with that, um, yeah, a little more why does it need to be so high up um i i might have mismeasured some things possibly 
or when it's colliding, it might be losing a little bit of energy. Uh, so anyways, uh, just, uh, I'm not entirely sure. That is, I think, not beyond the, uh, the boundary of where it's measurement error. So I'm not quite sure why it's doing that thing. Uh, but OK, um, just a little more. And from that height of mysteriously a little bit higher place, um, it can do the loop the loop um, here. OK, it's doing loop the loop. But even in this scenario, once I turn on the friction, once I make it roll without slipping, then it's uh, um, again going to be unable to do the loop the loop maneuver. Watch. And it frankly doesn't matter um, at uh, what size it is. So let me just uh, um, let me just go back to this larger sphere because it's more pleasant to work with. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure with the smaller sphere why I had to push it up so high. Uh, let me just make sure this does loop the loop maneuver um, without friction. And then it won't do the loop the loop maneuver with the friction. So at this point in the semester, uh, we can actually work out what it is that we needed, uh, let me just bring it down a little bit in height. <laughs> I, I don't know why the radius of the thing matters. As long as you're tracking the center of mass, it shouldn't matter. It might be that, you know, this portion, because uh, um, it, when it's uh, in this position, its center of mass is actually a little bit lower. So maybe uh, let me just bring it down a little bit lower. So I think I can do from here. Um, so, you know, from here, it can't do the loop the loop. Uh, what when it's rolling and when it's not rolling, it can it should be able to do the loop the loop. Yeah, good. Okay. So, so now we are equipped. Now that we are covering rigid body motion, including rotation, and that we have covered rotational kinetic energy. We, can, we are equipped to talk about the missing piece here once this object is start rolling. So let me do in um, red color or pink color the things that we are missing. So the um, so we are used to dealing with oh, pink color is invisible. Um, let me do it in red color. Is that going to be any? I think it's still going to be pretty invisible. Uh, let me try the orange color. Uh, it's still in let me do it in green. Let me do it in white. Okay. Let me do it in white color. Um, the corrections to this expression here and actually uh, erase this portion of the um, thing so that it uh, doesn't. I mean, it's going to remain in contact. That is what we are looking for. Um, so, okay. So we've talked about translational kinetic energy. In fact, we've talked about kinetic energy, and that is was translational kinetic energy, one half mv squared. And what we are covering this week is with the rotational motion in mind, there's the rotational analog to the translational kinetic energy. We would call it rotational kinetic energy. And it has an expression that actually reminds you of this expression, one half and you have rotational analog of mass, something called rotational inertia or moment of inertia times uh, the rotational speed or angular speed. We use letter omega, which kind of looks like a W, but it's not W. It's Greek letter omega, lowercase, uh, squared. So this is the expression for rotational kinetic energy. And before, when I was working out these kinetic energies, what I was really working with was the translational kinetic energy. And uh, what I needed to include is the rotational kinetic energy. And uh, in snapshot one, I should add the rotational kinetic energy as well. But because it's a starting from rest, the rotational kinetic energy will be zero as well. So, um, I, so this is my missing term. I had plus one half i omega squared that should have been there to do the correct analysis 
to correctly figure out what this height needs to be once the rotational motion is a factor. So, um, so let me rewrite this one half i omega squared so that I can still, you know, hopefully cancel out the things that I was canceling out before. So it amounts to knowing uh, how to re-express i in terms of quantities we've been working with and knowing how to re-express omega in terms of quantities we've been working with. So with i, you really have to know the rotational inertia of a sphere rotated about center of mass. And um, my memory isn't what it used to be. It's either 2 fifth or 3 fifth of uh, mass of the sphere times r squared. Um, since I'm not 100% sure, let's uh, look it up in the textbook. I can do that. Um, so let's go to the textbook where we can just not wonder what it is and just uh, know <laughs> what it is. Um, that I've, <laughs> I, you know, I do have some rotational inertia memorized, but um, at some point you can just look up the table, like uh, being able to have it all memorized. Every single uh, odd geometric shape doesn't have that value anymore. Um, so I just say, just to make sure you know where to look it up. And as long as you know where to look it up, you know, you can just look it up. I have the disk memorized one half. Yeah, good. As far as the solid sphere goes, okay, it's two fifth. Okay, I must have been remembering that three. So, two fifth uh, mr squared. So, that's going to be the rotational inertia of my uh, solid sphere. Or, oh, you know what? I'm not sure if I'm dealing with the sphere. Uh, so, when I see this shape, I imagine it as a sphere, but I think it's actually a disk because it's a, this is a two-dimensional simulation. So they, it would make sense for them to simulate it as a disk, not a sphere. So if it's a disk, then this would be one half mR squared. Uh, in any case, that's larger, so it'll give me more margin of error. So I'll go with that. So it's not rotational inertia of a sphere, it'll be rotational inertia of a disk. Uh, about its center of mass, one half mr squared. So I need that. For omega, I need something called rolling without slipping condition. And I have a lecture video that goes in more detail, just giving you the formula here. It's going to be the speed of the center of mass, the translational speed of the center of mass, divided by the radius of the object. Here, it, this r would be the same r as that, radius of this object. Uh, don't confuse that with uh, this r, which, uh, <laughs> which, which is this r. Uh, maybe I should, uh, uh, in the interest of avoiding confusion, I probably should rewrite this as lowercase r and lowercase r and just be consistent about not confusing the two. Um, so, uh, so I need to substitute this in, into that expression for rotational kinetic energy and see what we get. The, expression for rotational kinetic energy is one half rotational inertia so another one half and lowercase r squared times omega squared so uh, v center of mass that's going to be actually this the same speed here squared divided by r squared so actually r squared cancels out so if i had forgotten to distinguish these r's from this r uh, <laughs> my mistake would have gone unnoticed because this expression would have canceled out so for rotational kinetic energy i have the expression one fourth mv squared let me plug in that v so it's going to be one fourth m um, r times g so Replacing this expression with that final simplified expression, one fourth m r g, you can see that okay, I can still do my cancellation of mass, I can still do my cancellation of g, and what would end up happening is before I had a two point five r to that expression, I'm adding another one fourth r, so that'll be plus zero point two five r. So I have to raise its height by basically about a half of this height here. So let me move it up by that much. And then let's see if uh, it's able to do the loop-the-loop -loop maneuver again. So I'm going to raise its height of center or the point of contact 
like about half that amount. I think that's about half of what it was, maybe a little more. <laughs> I just eyeballing it. About half of this is, I think, that. So let's give it a try. Let's see if it's uh, able to do the loop the loop maneuver. Oops, uh, I need to bring back friction. The exact amount doesn't matter as long as it's uh, enough to allow it to roll without slipping. And yeah, now it's able to complete. And just in case someone thinks, oh, you just put it high enough so that it can do that. Well, let's just bring it down a little bit. This is uh, really the advantage of simulation. I think in real world, the the kind of the control over friction is not good enough. I don't know if you saw. So um, let me just uh, pause it where I see it just the barely coming off contact there it came off contact there <laughs> so um so the little amount i uh brought it below was enough to make it so that it can actually properly do the loop the loop maneuver so so anyways so um so uh, th this is the kind of the beautiful nice or interesting complication to the thing that you saw before um, when once uh, objects are starting to roll, once uh, in a rigid body rotation, once there's rotational motion in addition to the translational motion, um, in different scenarios you have to uh, modify some of the analysis that you did before. So um, up until this week, we have been ignoring rotational kinetic energy, like with uh, still balls. <laughs> um, so. Um, so uh, the tool that you are being given this week is how to take that into account, how to take those complications into account. So uh, let me just wrap up this simulation with just a, a demonstration with the smaller mass. So with this one, I kind of have to be careful. Um, so so the thing that I have to be careful is uh, because of you know smaller size, you know it's a center of mass when it's here. So I think uh, it actually start needs to start from here in order for it to do the loop the loop maneuver when it's not rotating. So let me first uh, set that up first, and then um, and then we'll go from there. So uh, try to get it to a height where it can just barely do the loop the loop maneuver. Okay, not yet. Need to raise it a little bit. I, it feels like I have to raise it more than I feel like I ought to, but you know what it does. So let me just do that. Uh, okay, I think just a little more, and it'll be it'll actually do the maneuver uh, without any um, any loss of contact. All right, so from that position, if I simply change it to um, um, material so that it has friction, then it will no longer be able to do loop the loop maneuver. And now what I needed to do is I need to kind of eyeball uh, what half of the distance here would be. So the distance that I am working with now is something like uh, this. I can draw a straight line. Uh, something like this distance. So I need about half of that, that much. Oh, I don't know if I have enough height. Um, I so let me try it here. If not, I'll need a little bit of editing to extend this ramp and then uh, we'll retry. So from here, it still has friction. Okay. Let's see if we can do the loop the loop maneuver. It might not be quite high enough. Okay. Yeah, it was quite high enough. I wonder if I just drop it from you know, this side, that is like a half that height. But if I do exactly that, when it collides, it'll lose energy. So maybe a little more. I don't know if that's going to work. Um, I don't think that's going to work. But I can give it a try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the collision, it would have lost a lot of energy. So I'll just have to extend that, um, extend that ramp a little bit. Let's see here. I'm trying to get the angle exactly right so that uh, can I? Doesn't I think if I do it at this angle, it can still kind of do the smooth transition. 
that's really what's important. Let me glue this to the background. Um, so okay, from this height, it needs to go half of that, so about that much. I think that's about right amount of height, like half. Yeah. Let's give it a try and see. There you go. Uh, it was just a little bit short. If you look at it, um, there's a brief moment where it lost the contact. Uh, right here. It lost the contact right here. Um, but, you know, so okay. It's, it should have been a little bit higher up there. Then now it can do the loop to loop maneuver without losing contact. So, so yeah, it, this uh, uh, formula, new formula that we derived is valid both for, you know, it, it doesn't depend on the radius of the sphere that, uh, the disk that you are rolling. It only depends on the, um, it, it only depends on um, the fact that we took rotational kinetic energy into account. And some of the geometric and the mass factors that might have mattered cancels out, so they don't end up mattering. So, so yeah, this is the situation. I wanted to demonstrate it. I wanted to redrive the formula because if it's not something I've done in the past. And I wanted to uh, verify the validity of the formula using simulation, uh, which, uh, you know, this kind of test is, again, really hard to do in the real world because we don't have precise control over friction and um, the height. Each time I place it, it'll change a little bit. Um, it, it, the simulation is the kind of thing that demonstrates theory more accurately than any in-person experiment again.